it feels like a particularly auspicious day to be having you on the program, given all the big billionaire news that's out this week, uh, even this morning, I think. It's, it's super recent. As it turns out, billionaires, as they are wont to do, have gotten even richer, richer than we even knew in the context of this global pandemic, which has created enormously harmful economic outcomes for everyone else. Now, in your latest book, you talk a lot about uh, this idea that doing well for the bulk of us, for the 99%, has a trade-off for the very, very rich. Um, And you have, unlike most of us, had opportunities to go into the lion's den, as it were, and to take this message straight to the 1%. What do you make of today's news? Um, Well, you know, there's been, as you said, a bunch of different things. It's hard for me to even keep track of like which one you might mean. But one of them, I think I saw that billionaire wealth, the top group went from 8 trillion to 13 trillion, not in the last century, not in the the lifetimes of the people on this podcast right now, not in the last administration, uh, in the pandemic, just in the pandemic. Um, So billionaires didn't survive COVID. They won COVID, right? COVID's not a game, but they won it anyway. And they won it um, in part because... Some of the companies they own, unlike most small businesses in America, actually did a lot better. Um, And some of that is demand. Some of that is like more people buying stuff on Amazon instead of stores. But a lot of that is the fact that the rigging they invest in um, on sunny days really, I mean, it pays off on sunny days too, but it really, really pays off on rainy days, right? So if you are... um, rigging the system through political campaign contributions and, um, you know, lobbying for bottle service, public policy that benefits you and your friends and hurts most people, you benefit to, you know, by, by, for example, staving off antitrust scrutiny and remaining a monopoly, you benefit from that at all times. But if a pandemic strikes, you're that, that the value of having staved off antitrust scrutiny, the value of being a monopoly is so, so, so much more. Um, and you can go down the line uh, across industries. And so uh, in so many ways, the investment that the plutocratic class has done over a generation uh, and longer in many ways to make public policy something that functions as their kind of private preserve that has weaponized basic ideas about how a democracy should work so that uh, so people are kind of gaslit into thinking that when a democracy works for billionaires, it is, a, it is a sign of its health and so on and so forth. Those things just laid the perfect groundwork for these people um, to thrive in a moment when most people were in, in you know, varying forms of extraordinary pain and anguish. What's so interesting about this conversation to me is that you would think it's very difficult to defend people who are this wealthy. And I think part of the issue is that it's very difficult to conceptualize how much money a billion dollars really is. So people think that there is a kind of a relationship between a million and a billion, <laughs> or they they see themselves as you know closer to a billion than obviously they should. Um but the the rationalization that you often get from regular people is some combination of what's the harm? They worked hard. They earned the money. Um, and, you know, why are you so bitter? I mean, there's often a kind of this edgy, edgy, you must be just resentful thing about it. But the first part is, I think, particularly pernicious because there is this idea that there is no trade-off between acc- accruing large, like enormously large sums of money. We're not, you know, uh, stratospheric amounts of money. We, you know, the number of billionaires has increased, what is it, uh, ninefold since the 1990s? I mean, we're, we're seeing exponential growth here. Um, and the fates of the rest of the country. Why do you, wh- what do you think is going on there? You know, it's such an important point. And for anybody who, who had the, you know, misfortune of studying a little bit of economics in college, you will remember that, that they go over this very basic concept, which does not actually happen in the real world, which is that, you know, 
if you're making a bunch of money from something, you, you get into some business, you're lucky, online books, let's say in the 90s, right? And you're making a bunch of money from it. What's going to happen is a bunch of other people are going to notice you're making a bunch of money from it and they're going to get in there and they're also going to make money from it, but you're going to have to cut your prices to compete with them or have better service. And you're not going to become a quadrillionaire in that model because if in the perfectly functioning markets that we learn about in Econ 101, that can't happen. If it's so lucrative, everybody and their brother is going to get in on the action. So a world in which people can make $200 billion is, let's just start by saying it's a world in which that is not happening. Yeah. So, and we can then talk about the morality of it, like, but just to st start with a very basic principle, the basic logic of a market, that there is so much profit to be made, that there's actually $200 billion of wealth in it. The fact that new entrants can't come in, it's just a clue that there's more to the story than the fact that you have a really compelling offering. And so then we have to start asking, what else are you doing besides having a compelling offering? Right now, we kind of know the $200 billion is almost proof of the crime, right? Because yeah. it's just not how a market works. So now yeah. that we have the proof that a crime has been committed, now we got to find out, like, what did you actually do, right? We just see the, the corpses over that. So now what did you actually do? And it turns out, in virtually every case I've ever heard, uh, if you start doing enough digging, it turns out they did do some shady stuff to get there. And the shady stuff runs the gamut, right? I mean, there, there is outright shady, shady, murderous stuff, like you sold opioids to, you know, hook people. You knew it was having very harmful effects. You kept doing it anyway. That's kind of on one end. And then there's like companies that are, you know, think of themselves as being very woke and they may put, put you know, black squares on Instagram last summer and this and that, right. but they lobby for tax policies that benefit them at the expense of others. They lobby against any kind of minimum wage increase or other uh, things on wages that when it, when Obamacare was under discussion, they lobbied to weaken that Medicare for all. They lobby to stave that off. Um, they push at every level um, of culture, of politics, of through their philanthropy, push for a world of privileges and immunities. And then they use the outsized wealth that would never actually accrue in any functioning market as proof of their brilliance. When in fact, it's literally just proof that there was no market. Yeah, there was no market. Fortunes like this are proof that no market was operating. Th this, is, this is what was so interesting to me about the book, because I confess, you, you describe a world of people who are kind of brought up to believe you can do good by doing well. And that is 100% the world I was inculcated in through my education. And I can't tell you how many people I had conversations with as we were graduating. And the standard was, you know, you were trying to hustle hard to work for McKinsey or Bain or BCG. And I like famously flunked all of my consulting interviews because I didn't know what APR was and just like didn't have a clue. And I felt like such a loser because everyone kn knew that the smartest kids were going to go work for a consulting company. And you were going to do it. Maybe they knew you before you fully knew yourself. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Although I will say one interviewer, I, I think it was maybe at McKinsey. They had asked me a question. I was clearly just flailing. And I said, you know what? I see here on your resume that you do editorial cartoons for the Crimson. Can you draw me something? And I spent like the last five minutes of the interview <laughs> sketching <laughs> so we didn't have to talk to each other anymore. Oh my gosh. Um, that, was, that was a real low point, but obviously uh, for the best. But the thing that's interesting about the book that I think, to me at least, is that the left sometimes will talk about the petty bourgeois. Like that's, I mean, the, the, this is who we're talking about. This this class of oftentimes first or second generation bourgeois, but people who really do believe in the narrative that there don't have to be any trade-offs between their kind of personal successes and accumulation of wealth. And obviously this is a very different scale than what we're talking about with the billionaires, but that the choices that they're making in their lives 
don't come as at a consequence to anybody else. And there's this idea that charity or philanthropy in particular can be a release valve that restores any imbalance that they might acknowledge on the periphery. Can you talk about that a little bit? I, I think it's it's so core to the discussion. You know, I I think with any book, it's about a hundred ideas, not one idea. But if I had to pick like the one idea that the book is about, it is a it is trying to slay the notion of the win-win. Right. And if you like I was literally reading some old clips of like um, democratic socialist politicians and like, it's amazing how many of them like use the word win-win casually, right? It's, it's just like such a casual word in the culture and it's not necessarily a bad word depending on what you mean, but it's just become one of these like articles of faith in the culture and these kind of phrases that people use. And when it comes to things we're talking about, the win-win means exactly what you said, that it is possible to do well by doing good. In other words, um, I can run a new kind of hedge fund, not the old kind. That was bad. I can run a new kind of hedge fund that centers the poor, helps the environment, fights anti-blackness, and makes amazing returns for shareholders. In other words, I'm aware that there are problems. I'm not an asshole. Like I'm aware that there are problems. I'm aware that the old thing wasn't good. There's a new way where I can win, win, right? The society can win, I can win. And then you see that for you know, social venture capital, all these things in finance. Then you see it with, you know, everything from Tom's shoes to when you go to Walgreens and it's like a dollar for this cause that you're going to do. Um, you see it on climate and just like a million, like little, like buy this tote bag. And, you know, it's all through our culture. It's in philanthropy where, you know, a like genuinely bad people like the Sacklers mm -hmm. or, like relatively more decent and humane people like Bill Gates, all members of the same fundamental class operating the same structure and the same set of incentives and often the same behaviors relative to the system will use the fact latter day generosity. They'll kind of weaponize it um, to say that's your win. And in exchange for giving you that victory for funding your after school program or donating to your hum hunger bank or, you know, on the more genuine side, like getting rid of polio or like doing some real stuff too. I want something. I want my win. And what I want my win to be is you not changing the system atop which I stand. And usually, and this was a little bit of a challenge for the book. And I think a little bit of a challenge for the argument I make is like, usually the evidentiary, I mean, you're a lawyer, like the evidentiary um, grist for that connection is often a little thin. Like, I mean, you can, you can find, like you can make the connections, right? But like, it's hard to find like Bill Gates being like, see, I donated this to Africa. The wealth tax should not happen, right? I mean, it's, it's I would love that if it was that explicit. I, you know, Occasionally, what you get is like advisors to these people who come to folks like me and tell that. So that, you know, that's helped me write the book. But occasionally, you actually get the evidence. And it's mm. so helpful. You may remember Leon Cooperman. Mm. Uh, he of the abundant CNBC tears during the Warren Wealth Tax um, <laughs> interviews that he was doing. You know, and it very explicitly, don't do X because I do Y. Don't do tax my wealth and take away my win because I'm giving you this win. Yeah. Um, you saw it with Michael Dell when AOC had her 70% marginal tax proposal right at the beginning of her first term. And Michael Dell goes to Davos and says, we can't do the 70% marginal tax on income because my wife and I have a foundation and we give it away more effectively in the government. In those moments, the mask slips and it is revealed that generosity is not just incidental to injustice, not just um, failing to deliver against injustice. It is a pillar. It's being used as a pillar to uphold injustice. Yeah. So I, I'm curious because you spend a considerable amount of time in the book interrogating what happens to people who become so-called thought leaders. And you talk about how there's been a shift from kind of the public intellectual who, you know, communicates in terms of problems, uh, identifying problems that are often systemic in nature and would require changing the status quo in meaningful ways that might come out of consequence to somebody's foundation. Um, and thought leaders who were able to package um, 
package problems in kind of these discrete little ways that have solutions that aren't necessarily structurally challenging. So you talk about the um, professor, social scientist who came up with the idea of the power pose. And she had spent her whole life doing substantive research about feminism and the uh, the effects of um, patriarchy on human lives and all of this. But she comes up with this one idea that's really cottoned onto by the elites because, and you're telling it's a way for them to say, yes, we acknowledge that sexism is a problem. Yes, we acknowledge there's inequities in the boardrooms, but we can change it by simply standing with your hands on your hips, you know, arms akimbo before you come into the meeting and we don't have to do anything about these structural practices. And I, and I'm, I, that chapter resonates with me in part because here we are, podcasters, <laughs> the new thought leaders in certain respects. And you yourself has now entered this world where because of this initial case that you made at, at Davos, you are also being invited into these spaces to, yes, speak truth to power, but now we're all kind of implicated in this world where arguably we're being turned into the very thing commodified by the very world um, that we're, we're criticizing. How, how are you, what do you make of that? How are you managing that, that turn? Yeah, how do we get I, invited to Davos? <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> to be clear, I actually wasn't at Davos when I, I, I like shame tweeted Davos uh, that same year, 2019, but I, and I've never been to Davos. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, what was it? Was the Aspen Institute? Yeah, it was the Aspen Institute okay. that, led, that led to the, spe the speech that led to the book. Um, it's a very good question. It's a delicate thing. It's something I think about a lot. To be clear, I think in what you just said, there's two different aspects to what can you know happen to a thinker that are actually different. One is about simplification and accessibility of ideas. Mm -hmm. And the other is about changing the diagnoses and the prescriptions to be more suitable to people in power. Mm -hmm. And those are sometimes conflated, but they're actually really different. So I am a big believer in doing the first. Big believer, right? I mean, I I actually this really, this is like sounds very name droppy, but it's like someone who's a real, you know, hero for me of, of this kind of like, serious thinker, but also dabble in clapbacks and like for her time is Gloria Steinem, right? She always called herself a media worker mm -hmm. because it was this idea of like, you operate across the different spaces. You're not like just a single thing. And I've struggled with like, am I spending too much time on Twitter or am I not? But I, but I, I keep spending time there. So what's something's going on. And I actually, this like really interesting conversation with her about like, is it cheapening this and that? And she said, the most radical thing you can do is be understood. Right. Wait, I don't, so, I don't really, but that's that's not that's not. The I know, thing. but I, I, I'm getting to the second thing. Okay. I'm just saying. I, I think that. But you said like, like so when you talk about commodifying, like part of that is the simplification of ideas, the making ideas well, digestible, making them meme worthy. That's good. The second thing you talk about is totally different, which is when you go into those spaces where you have to do the sound bite or the shorter thing, or to get invited into the lion's den. Do you? change what you say to suit that space. Right. And that, while I do the first thing vigorously, I try not to do the second thing at all. I can't say I succeed all the time. But here's but what I, I really liked about what you said in the book. You acknowledged and you interviewed people who were self-aware, right? Um, there was the one journalist who had written critically about Hillary Clinton's speeches and the corrupting influence of them and mm -hmm. then found himself – Doing, giving a lot of speeches as part of his own, um, you know, professional trajectory and, you know, f deciding, saying, saying to you that he didn't feel like it had a negative impact on his own message. And maybe it, maybe it has, maybe it hasn't, maybe it nipped away at the end, but at the, at the edges rather, but you seem to articulate some skepticism that one could have kind of as Doing these, you know, being in these kind of spaces could have a, a zero effect on you, right? Whether it's simply just because you're around people who think a certain way and you sand off the edges just a little bit because you become friends and colleagues with folks and you don't want to hurt their feelings and you don't want to feel so adversarial all the time. And we deal with this in journalism, right? There's a lot of accusations going around right now about whether this media person or that left media person is pulling punches about crit critique of some of the squad members because they want access to them. And I think it's, you know... It's not necessarily helpful to think of it all ways as this person's like selling out, but these are really these I think are really sincere pressures that everyone has to deal with, no matter how well intentioned. Yep. 
I, I think that's right. And I think, I think for me, it is a lot about how you make your case and not what case you're making. Um, I think some of these things that I have been writing and speaking about, I have been able to say at length in very hospitable uh, environments and in very inhospitable ones. And I think if you were to pull the tape, I don't think what I say on Morning Joe is different uh, than what I would say to you. Um, I think what would be different on Morning Joe is I would probably be working harder to hook into frames that the people around the table or people in the world watching that have intuitions they have if my if i assume they don't share some of my prior assumptions i might make a pitch for the things i'm talking about as being you know profoundly unpatriotic to have a country so oriented to billionaires sure. i may not need to make that pitch to you because you generally don't think the billionaire led you know plutocracy is the way to go anyway it's an easier lift to you but if i'm talking to uh, that kind of audience on television or, you know, in the, in the physical world when that's possible again. Uh, I think a lot about, and this is not about politics so much as about writing and art. I think a lot about the fact that what I'm trying to do generally is get behind the enemy lines of people's minds, you know, um, people who are generally sympathetic to what I'm saying, or they, they make me feel good, but they're not, they're not, super useful to what I'm trying to do as a writer. Um, and I'll give you a different example apart from the, the uh, issues of, of wealth and plutocracy that always, that really was a lesson for me in this. My, so Winter's Take All is my third book. My second book is called The True American. And um, completely different type of book because it's just a, it's a, it's nonfiction, but it's a true story of two guys in Texas and white supremacist who shoots a bunch of people after 9-11, you know, people he thinks are Arab terrorists, uh, three South Asian gas station mini-mart workers. Two of them die, one survives. The survivor's blind in one eye, but lives, feels grateful, rebuilds his life in America, feels grateful for having been able to do that despite all that happened to him, eventually forgives this white supremacist who makes it to death row and fights to save his life. It's a wild story, these two men. And... In telling this story, it was so zoomed in, unlike Winners Take All, which is more macro. It was so zoomed in. It was very much a hidden argument for a pluralist America. It was a, you know, dismantling of, of like Trumpism before there was Trumpism, this kind of resentful, downwardly mobile white guy in Texas who, you know, saw the existence of other people as a threat to him, uh, to his being, and so on and so forth. But in that book, unlike many of my other writings, all the ideas were hidden. They were there, but they were hidden. In fact, in some cases, they had been written. And I actually did one of the many edits I did in that book. I like did an idea removing edit. I mean, they were all in there, but I kind of like boiled them out and left them through, you know, to be, to work through the story. And that book, unlike anything I've ever written, got behind enemy lines. There were all kinds of fundamentalist Christians who were like, mm. I've never seen Islam in this way. It made me real, you know, these Muslims are really like us. They, they just, they believe in God. They care for their families, this and that. And it made me realize how in a lot of the rest of my writing and advocacy, like I'm not getting there when I could get there. Um, so I don't always try to do that kind of story. Um, I still try to do a lot of narrative based stories, even in Winners Take All, though it's several people, not one or two. Yeah. But part of how I think about that is you want to hook into these intuitions that people have when they're not necessarily your intuitions. Yeah, I, I think that winner's take all is very effective in part because you resist coming out and saying, you know, bi billionaires are bad and, and this is why. You, you, the story is very much told. The tensions are very much told through the eyes of people who in many ways have bought in to the system already, who've, who've done the McKinsey circuit, who went to... B school or what have you, and then begin to challenge their own beliefs, often after they've accumulated wealth and are now considering what they want their life to mean more substantively. And so to the extent that you, this book is trying to reach those people or people who are sympathetic to those folks, 
who wish they had those opportunities, um, it doesn't come off as kind of hostile or it doesn't breed a defensiveness. And I found myself reading it, you know, the first person who clued me into your book years ago was my best friend from college, who after eight years in the Navy, went to business school, worked for a consulting firm and was reading your book and just hating everything about her life. And I, I go back and forth. I think I'm much more sympathetic than many on the left to the idea that some of these folks can be reached and spoken to and like pulled to our side. In your work, you know, in the years since the book, have you changed your mind at all about how much it's useful to get kind of the upper middle classes, the professional managerial class to buy into the idea that we need a substantive system overhaul or whether or not we should just stop trying to argue with those people and focus on mobilizing the working class? It's a great question, but I would say it's a little more complicated than that because because having that kind of humanistic approach to the characters who are in that class, I don't think the goal of that or the object of that is to make the book sympathetic to those kind of readers. Mm. I think, you know, m- like a lot of readers at all levels of life are turned off by what they perceive as, you know, there's just that human tendency to go to the underdog, right? And even when you're writing about overdogs, it's possible to write about overdogs in a way that turns them into underdogs and turns you, the author, into the asshole. And I get this wrong all the time. Like I will go after Jamie Dimon in a tweet, but because I like cross a line in the way I frame it, somehow I've taken like, someone making 25 grand and like turn them into like rushing to Jamie Diamond's right. defense. Ha- haven't you heard he's the nicest of the plutocrats? That's, that's what we were told. Yes, exactly. And Bernie did exactly. it. Exactly. Like, hey, and I got people from, from school going, oh, but he's the nicest one. <laughs> it's so funny. Like I had this, you know, I did this podcast the other day with Michael Cohen, Trump's former fixer. Mm-hmm. And like, I was really tough on Cause he was just like so obtuse on all this like philanthropy stuff. And just like, dude, like Eric Trump giving to a hospital, like come Right. And I was like, I feel like I was like fair on all my, like a lot of people responding to that who I don't think were necessarily like, like in work, working for big Michael Cohen Inc. Like we're just like, you know, I was sympathetic to a lot of what you're saying, but like you were just browbeating him and you like turned me, you know? So I, I think that's, I think about that. So I'm not, trying to say the foundation boss who I write about or the, you know, person at the Soros thing or the person uh, that, you know, the young, the young woman who leaves the consulting world or some of these, you know, Bill Clinton, these other characters in the book, I'm not trying to pull punches on them. I'm trying to approach it in a literary artistic way Mm -hmm. where frankly, a very ordinary person in the middle of the country who is not part of that world feels, uh, protective more of me than of them. 